These are the regions of the world used by Noah as temperature regions, and they use these regions to somehow arrive at an average for them all to give you a global temperature record for 2023 as a record temperature. Now, if you look at these regions, um, there are seven regions which are actually not records for this year. They had previous years, and the years are given there in the table, when the temperatures were higher. I mean, Antarctica, as an example, just to show you how this works, had 2007. The temperature was higher in Antarctica than it was last year. While we're at it, the one next to it, the Arctic, that temperature was higher in 2016 than it was last year. So now you understand that the, how this works, you can see that seven of the regions were actually not records and six were records. It should also be noticed that this temperature increase, this record level, was not occurring across globally dominant regional land areas. That include Asia, for example. Asia wasn't a record. Europe wasn't a record. US actually wasn't a record. We'll deal with that later. Oceania, which is Australia area, that wasn't a record. Hawaiian region wasn't a record, nor was the Arctic or the Antarctic a record. It's just the other areas that were records. So the record areas were South America, Atlantic MDR, Caribbean islands and the Gulf of Mexico. They were the record areas. We are leaving out North America at the moment because we're going to show you it definitely was not a record. So where we have record temperatures according to NOAA are, well it's South America there, Atlantic MDR, what's that? Well this image shows it, it's the main development region for hurricanes. It's an oceanic region in the Atlantic basically. The Caribbean islands, which is mainly water, and of course the Gulf of Mexico. So it's really a, a particular region of the world where it's got record temperatures. Let's look at that. Well, as you can see here, we've had a very strong El Nino this year, which is still going and maybe gone by the spring. We don't know. And we've also had an Atlantic multi-decadal of oscillation temperature, which again is going to be dying. The, these, both of these are going to disappear next year. And um, that's going to bring in quite a lot of cold. Cold compared to the tropic high temperatures is going to be more extreme weather as well. So this is the satellite temperature record from John Christie and Roy Spencer. Now, this is measuring the troposphere. It's measuring the part of the atmosphere we live in, as it were, and is global and um, far better than the terrible spread or inadequate spread of temperature gauges around the world. And I trust it far more. But don't forget, this, these temperatures include the urban heat island effect everywhere, and it's quite significant. And so I want to now move into the effect of the urban heat island. And Roy Spencer has done quite a lot of work on this. It's a work in progress. But to give you some idea of what he's found, um, let's just look at some of his images um, using data sets for population, urban density and so on and working on that and here they are. Now the link to this work is in the description if anyone wants to go into detail but what you're looking at is the urban heat island change since 1850 till today as it were so they've coloured it yellow and red and so on that's urban heat island effect and he's analysed these around the world the yellow and red colours are urban heat islands. And basically, if you measure temperatures inside there, you're going to get higher temperatures. But you're going to get one particular temperature that's significant higher than it really should be. Average temperature is calculated by simply adding the max and the minimum temperature for the day and dividing it by two. I know that's very simple, but that's exactly how it's done. But with an urban heat island, you often get a lot of heat retained in the concrete and the tarmac and everything else around the temperature gauge, even within a mile or two of that area, it doesn't matter. You get a lot more heat at night retained, and so it tends to raise the minimum temperature. And by raising the minimum temperature, 
it of course raises the average temperature. So it's good to look at the maximum temperatures for the day and the minimum temperatures for the day individually. And what we're going to do now is look at that for the USA. But we're not going to trust anything except the standard reference network. That's the network that was set up in 2005, so we've almost had 20 years of it now. It was set up, absolutely immaculate stations spread over the USA, meant to give the definitive temperatures for the USA without any urban heat island effect. So let's look at those temperatures for the USA. So this is the standard reference network, which we know shouldn't have any urban heat island effects in it at all, and these are the minimum temperatures. And by the way, you can just dial in whatever you want, what region you want, and so on, into this um, NOAA website and get all the data, not just on the standard reference, but for everything I'm doing here. And the link for that is in the description. Anyway, here is the minimum. Now, no warming, if anything. Well, no warming, really. Now, look at the maximum. Well, again, we're not seeing any maximum. If anything, it's a bit less, but there's no warming. So well, let's go for the average. And again, no warming. If anything, a slight cooling. So the USA is but being told this last year was record warmth. But it wasn't, was it? Not when you take the urban heat island effect out and use their own system that they use to get rid of that, which is the standard reference network. There's something really stinks here, isn't there? Now back to Roy Spencer and the study he did on the urban heat island effect on a worldwide basis. He wrote this. As previously announced, our paper submitted for publication on the method showed that the urban heat island effect warming in the US since 1895 is 57% of the GHCN warming trend averaged over all suburban and urban stations. But because most of the US GHCN stations that go into the CONUS area average are rural, the UHI warming trend area averaged across all GHCN stations is only 20% of that computed from the GHCN data. Thus, there is evidence that the GHCN warming trends for the US as a whole have been inflated somewhat by 20% or so by the urban heat island effect but a much larger fraction at urban station locations. The urban heat island contamination of the average area trends could be larger than this, since we do not account for some regions possibly having increased levels of urban heat island contamination as prosperity increases, more buildings, pavements, vehicles, air conditioning and other waste heat increases, but population remaining the same. In this short video, I've tried to uh, debunk, if you like, the hottest year on record claim. But even if it was true that it was the hottest year, well, since when? Well, it certainly wasn't the hottest year uh, 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 since uh, 1930s, they were hotter. It certainly wasn't the hottest year medieval warm period. Um, what they're trying to do always is use extreme weather events, not climate, extreme weather events uh, to scare people. Um, it looks to me, I'm pretty confident of it, that we're now entering a cooling period. I've done a video on it. Um, the North Atlantic Decadal, I can never say it, North Atlantic Decadal um, Cycle coming to an end. The El Nino will come to an end. So those hot um, water temperatures, which they're using and misusing, I would say, um, will, will be gone. But more than that, there's a 190-year cycle that we're coming down on. So, like uh, Valentina uh, from Northumberland University, professor there, I agree, by between now and 2035, we're cooling, um, and that's going to happen. They're probably going to get more, we're probably going to get more extreme weather because of that, and they're somehow going to blame the cooling on global warming. I know they will. Um, here on this graph, uh, the bottom graph, it's in Fahrenheit, by the way, degrees Fahrenheit, you'll see the change in temperatures, a human being, you would have felt, uh, on average, since the Little Ice Age, sorry, since 1850. Uh, the top graph is how they express that, because they use, not temperature absolute, but they use an anomaly. So they compare the temperature so to a 30-year period and only have a scale of maybe one or so degrees for it. So tiny, tiny, point one changes a lot. That's the right thing to do in terms of science, because it tends to detect, it picks the trend out. 
but it isn't what you feel and it's being misused all the time um, so I just thought I'd show you that graph to put a perspective on all this um, basically one degree centigrade change we just had over that since 1850 and by the way it was warming before that it started warming from about 1690 or so um, uh, and naturally obviously um, the one degree we've had it equates to about 80 miles of tree line so I can explain that in the medieval warm period we know that in Canada we had a tree line 80 miles further north as we did in Russia etc it was warmer then and um, but when you move that up you also move everything else up so we have much more food supply around the world and so on we actually could do with the one to one and a half degrees warming anyway it'd be good for us it wouldn't be bad for us it doesn't increase the temperature in the mid parts the temperature changes always from each end the other thing is of course um, the Arctic um, now is 21 years um, record since in other words the we've got a greater sea ice extent I think it was on the 8th of January than we had 21 years ago so uh, you know that's rather different to what you people think and the Antarctic has been cooling for a long time and um, people panic about icebergs coming adrift which are perfectly normal if they didn't come adrift the ice would gradually get up to the equator wouldn't it think about it, common sense things you know people's common sense from the normal public who don't understand maybe or deal with the science is often very often right whereas the the alarmists are just doing everything they can to, to disturb you and the trouble is it's entered the education system it's entered everywhere it's just everywhere I'm the only voice on on British um, TV or radio um, giving any message uh, uh, about we need more CO2 that the whole basis of this is wrong people can argue this or that but in doing that they very often are accepting the base of the alarmist which is that CO2 is, is a problem it isn't it really isn't we could do with more of it and therefore I'm going to continue to do all I can to eke out my few minutes a week on on, on GB News I'm going to try and eke that out to try and get more air time to try to give a balanced view where I haven't got just two or three minutes I, I roughly travel 200 miles for every minute it gets um, to, to, uh, uh, I haven't got just that I've got um, time to give a balanced view like to explain what the real difference is in science between the alarmists uh, 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 and the realists um, and that's that's what I'd love to be able to do so I thank you for watching these uh, videos I really do uh, oh by the way I've been demonetized now on on uh, YouTube uh, and um, so um, uh, the total money I've earned in all the years I've been doing this now I think is less than 410 pounds but it's basically nothing from going forward I get about one pound fifty uh, per video on average at the moment for four or five thousand views that's what they've knocked me down to now uh, and um, so I'm not doing it for money it makes no difference I still produce these videos but it's just part of the world where people like me are silenced or they attempt to silence us and they don't want the truth they say the debate is over there's never been a debate and with that thought I'll say thank you for watching see you again soon